Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for making it out on this Sunday morning after two progress bars in a row. I'm impressed. There's so many, there's so many faces here. Um, I'm going to talk. How long do I have, Lucas? Uh, 45, minutes. 45 minutes. OK, uh, so I'll try not to be like a podcast that you're listening to at like two times speed uh, to get through <laughs> to get through the material quickly. Um, could I have actually a little less light on me because because I just it's a uh, it's more about the images. So I'd like to talk this morning about a project um, that I've done. It launched, it launched actually three years ago in 2015. Um, it's a project called Ashtach. And uh, Ashtach is an Irish word. It means sort of wondrous, strange, queer. Um, so Irish people would even use the expression, it's rud ashtach a, like it's a funny, weird thing or something like that. So um, if people speak Irish, they do understand. And when I say the ashtach foundation, already that's sort of a trigger that something is slightly, something is slightly afoot. Um, but before I... Before I talk about Ashtok, I just want to sort of uh, mention three just short anecdotes from my experience growing up in Ireland. And really, these are things that inform the way that I think about sound and the way I think about what music is, what art is. Uh, the first one is to do with Finn McCool and the Fianna. I know, Lucas, you said it's very difficult to pronounce, um, to pronounce uh, words in the Irish language. So that's Finn McCool. Um, uh, very efficient use of letters there. Um, so Finn McCool was a really, really important figure in Irish mythology. Um, he was the head of a band of warriors called the Fianna. And uh, still to this day, we have Irish political parties called Fianna Foil and Fianna Gael um, from, from that, uh, der deriving from that sort of usage. And the, the interesting thing about the Fianna was that they weren't just fighters, they were sort of sensitive guys who like to discuss poetry and the meaning of life and things like that. And so one of the mythological tales goes that the Fianna are sitting around the campfire one night and they're discussing what is the greatest music in the world. And, you know, somebody says it's the pipes, uh, the Illin pipes, and somebody else says it's the fiddle. And then they sort of get a little bit, you know, a little bit out there and they say, oh no, it's waves breaking on the, the seashore, it's the wind through the trees, all this sort of stuff. And of of course, finally they say to Finn, what do you think is the greatest music in the world? And Finn says, the music of what happens. And I think this is really beautiful. I wish that I'd been taught this uh, more forcefully in school because it sort of predates John Cage by thousands of years and, and sort of opens up this very generous space uh, through which we just decide that whatever, whatever happens is art. It's just purely the framing how we choose to treat it that way. The next uh, anecdote is to do with the telephone system in Ireland. Um, in the 80s, um, it was taken as a completely acknowledged fact that all of the telephone calls in and out of Ireland were surveilled by a British uh, surveillance system called Echelon. And this was, people just understood that this was part of everyday life. Uh, my sister would drive my mother crazy uh, by, you know, being on the phone, talking about, you know, going to the school disco and then she would shout things like Semtex, um, you know, into the phone. And, and in our brains, we actually thought that, you know, there was a guy in a spy basement, you know, and like some Irish teenage kid shouts, like, I've got the gear in the Semtex, and then this red light flashes, you know, and he has to listen, and then it goes back to, I don't know if I fancy Dermot more, Aidan more, you, you know, and it's sort of... But, but it was interesting to me because we understood as teenagers that we were embedded in a political space that was surveilled. Um, and we felt through sort of shouting things like this over the phone that we were, we could sort of activate our nodes in a surveillance network. You know, that we could feel that we had some little bit of agency by just basically trolling the network um, and upsetting our parents in the, in the, in the process. So, so sort of this idea of sound as being something which is political, um, which has a much larger meaning um, and which places you within a much larger network that you are a member of. Of, um, that, and that you can sort of feel that sense of being connected. The third one is to do with my granny. Um, so my granny, um, this is actually, I realized, it's a picture of us in the Efteling. So, uh, <laughs> I know, yeah, represent. So I'm actually holding a Efteling flag in my hand there. Um, so when I was very small, I was in my granny's house, and my granny, who was um, not a conceptual artist, 
um, in the traditional sense. Um, but I, I had sort of a little bit of tinnitus in my ear and I was sort of pulling my ear and my granny said to me, what's wrong with you? And I said, oh, I've got this, this tone, I can hear this pitch in my ear. And my granny said, oh, that's, that's just the screaming of the souls in purgatory. <laughs> and um, she actually believed this. This was sort of, you know, like a lot of people believe this as, I don't know if you call this an urban myth when it's sort of a Catholic myth, um, but she believed this. And, you know, I must have been, I don't know, five or six, and I sort of thought, that's pretty cool. Um, you, you know, in that I was sort of thinking, like, I've got my brain and it's wired into dead people in another dimension and I can hear them, but there's some sort of process that's happening to the sound so that instead of hearing, you know, I'm just hearing like, uh, so, so sort of at the time, I just sort of accepted this in the same way that, you know, my dad told me that you couldn't have the light on in the car to read because planes would land on the cars because they thought they were a runway. So, you know, it's not till you're much older and you're in a car and somebody turns the light on and you think, we should turn that off because the play, oh no, God, he lied to me. Um, so sort of, as you get older, you think, you know, oh, there's that, the screaming. No, it's not, it's just my eardrum. So, so sort of this way, these three things I sort of are emblematic of the way that I think about sound in that it's something that's really a large field that's up for grabs. Anything can be contained within it. Um, it's political, it has social meaning and also like the sort of the stories that we tell around it are just as important as the actual sound frequencies that we're listening to. So um, to roll back a little bit, I want to just sort of explain my thinking as I came up to making the Ashtag project. And that has its roots in this project uh, called Groupat, um, which I hope is an easier word to, to sort of sound out in your brain. Um, so luckily the Irish accent, it's called the fada, which means lengthen, to lengthen something. So it's always lengthening the vowel. Uh, so Groupat was a project I did. It started in 2007 and the official commissioning period of it was two years long. Now, it's important um, that I explain that this was a project that happened at the tail end of the Celtic Tiger, at the, at the tail end of the economic boom in Ireland. Because between the mid-90s and the crash, um, we had this very compressed period of economic growth in Ireland that meant that we had huge social change that occurred in a very, very short period of time. So when I was growing up, I think there was 20% unemployment, everybody left, everybody emigrated. There was a sense that you might never be able to move back to Ireland, there would never be jobs there. Um, a lot of the time it was actually difficult to do music performance degrees. It, you know, they only, I think they started one in 1993 and there was only like one person the first year uh, doing that in the Royal Academy in Dublin. Now it's full of people who stay in Ireland, but everybody left and everybody went and studied elsewhere as well as got jobs elsewhere. Um, then we had this economic boom, which for my generation, um, which is a little bit confusing because we left one country and now the country is completely changed. But as a result of that, there were some public art commissions that happened on a scale that they'd never happened before. And it sort of felt like the arts funding equivalent of like Wall Street cocaine and, you know, sort of bit like just hubris, if you know what I mean, because up to that point, the public art commissions had often been quite earnest, um, very worthy uh, projects like let's make bronze casts of the residents' hands and we'll put them in a sculpture at the motorway intersection or something like this. You know these sort of projects. Um, but I got funded to do a public art project where I said, I'm going to make this completely fictional set of sound art practitioners and I'm just going to make all their work as if they've existed for years and they said yeah go for it you know so they were sort of um, they were trying to really deepen the idea of what that practice could be and what public art could be and make it and and sort of like sort of stretch back the boundaries and this was the tail end of the Celtic Tiger so they had money um, that they'd got because Microsoft built a campus and Facebook built a campus and all tiny percentages of those of those bu budgets went to the local authorities so um, we had a huge production budget, which meant we could do a lot of different things. 
so when I did group at, it, it, I started the project in 2007 proper, um, and it ran for sort of this commissioning period for two years. And during that period, um, my position on the project was that I was a commissioner slash curator. Um, and so I claimed that I was working with this nine member collective called group at, um, and that they made work in a wide variety of different ways. So I'm just gonna mention these people, they're all me, but I'll talk about them as if they're real, because it's actually, easier that way. So I had different alter egos like Turf Boone, um, who's a freegan and makes all of his um, instruments uh, from secondhand material. So this is the Kushal Tier marimba phone, which is an octave um, in scale. Um, so, so sort of he he would work with with all secondhand materials because with turf, I was interested in this idea of um, art can be extremely wasteful, and the byproducts of making art can be a huge amount of materials that never gets reused. So I was interested in that. Um, I also had Detleva Verens. She uh, was an immigrant to Ireland. She's a Estonian, and she works a lot with uh, systems theory. So this is a score. It's this is actually basically how big the score is in in real life, um, and it's based on the structures that the Marshallese Islanders use in their stick maps. Because uh, the Marshallese, that's real, okay? Uh, so the the Marshallese Islanders use stick maps to make maps of the ocean. So there's very little topo topography. There's maybe a stone here and a stone there that indicate two islands, but the rest of it is just showing you ocean currents. And so when I read about this, I thought, oh my God, this is the perfect way to notate music because it's just sort of nodes, nodes and sounds moving along these sort of currents of energy. So I made structures like this for Detleva. Um, I made sonic reliquaries. This is Violetta Mahan, who is the outsider artist, a member of Group At. And she's sort of like Hildegard von Bingen and Andre Breton had a child. And that's, that's Violetta Mahan in that it's this total reverence for sound. She makes these sonic reliquaries based on sort of Christian and African reliquary traditions and there's sounds trapped inside of them. So the one on the right has the sounds of the Tala Youth Band uh, marching past the Tala Choral Society. Um, and the one on the left has uh, Halloween is our big night where people set off illegal fireworks and, and make bonfires and things like that. So it's to do with that sound world. Um, I won't go into detail because there's so much work it would take several hours to even try to tip, get the tip of the iceberg with group at. Um, I will, I will pass around this book, which unfortunately was in a bag that maybe there was some oat cakes in, because there's some crumbs on it. Um, like oat cakes, it's what musician, Irish musicians all travel with them for sustenance. Um, so the group art book, this will give you an idea if you flick through it, there's different sort of chapters on the different people. Um, and, and so you can sort of see some of the different characters. But one identity that I sort of, I think was sort of pivotal in the way that my, th my thinking would move forward was the Park Service, real name Dermot Fitzpatrick. Um, so the Park Service, um, you know, I was really, when I was, when I was sort of inhabiting the headspace of the Park Service, for me it was very much this sort of, um, nerdocentric um, hacking. He does sound installations in burnt out cars on wasteland. Um, he takes museum audio guides and hacks them. Uh, so there's alternative descriptions of, of, of the museum experience and things like that. But I made this one sound installation called The Legend of the Fornar Resistance. Um, and the form of this um, it took place, there was this small wooden shed with, you know, camouflage webbing, wooden chips, wood chips all around it, sort of smelt sort of mulchy and, and sort of slightly like the deep woods. But my idea for the Park Service was that he lived south of Dublin in a valley called Glenasmoel. And Glenasmoel legendarily has very bad television reception uh, because it's a valley. And before they got cable, it was just, you know, antennae up or aerials on top. So um, he and his brothers, my idea was that they invented a role-playing game called The Legend of the Fornar Resistance, which was set in the land of Emeraldia. Um, and sort of, so when you entered the, when you, en this was supposed to be an installation that was him reproducing his role-playing environment with him and his brothers uh, that they had created. So, you know, all the drawings were on lined paper, so it just looked like it had been somebody down the back of the class, uh, you know, lovingly rendering the chimeric mutants uh, in, in biro pen and stuff like this. But it was very important to me to try and think of a way of thinking about Ireland that wasn't just about the past. Uh, and I'll come 
to that in a, in, in a second and delve into that a little bit more deeply. So the land of Emeraldia is, it, this is all set in the future and it's all about uh, transhumanism. So the land of, uh, land of, I'm gonna take this so I can look at this. So the land of Emeraldia, um, like the, the north of Ireland is covered in sand fog and the border has turned into the silent curtain. Um, Cork has been blasted away in the second zombie uprising and sort of, you, you know, Limerick is, is the Lycan territory. They're like werewolves, and and sort of so there's all these there's all these sort of things splattering around and within the I don't know if, I mean I don't know if I should embarrass everybody by forcing a show of hands over how many people have played Dungeons and Dragons or similar role playing games, um, but generally when you play Dungeons and Dragons you have two different catalogs. You have the Dungeon Master's Manual, which is all the rules, and then you have the Monster Manual, which tells you all of the different qualities like you have to roll, roll plus nine on this device, uh, on this dice to defeat this monster because they have plus 15 shield qualities or something like that. So um, what I found was that when I was researching this territory, Glenismol, where the Park Service, I wanted him to be situated, that there was an Irish mythological tale called the Burning of Daw Darragas Hostel that was based in Glenismol. And the Burning of Dar Daw Darragas Hostel consists of a little short prelude where they all arrive to the hostel, which is this massive, massive house, and then a huge list of all of the monsters in the house, because they just keep looking in the window and saying, oh, there's a man in there and he's green and he has seven arms and purple eyes. And they go, okay, what's in the next room? And then at the very end, there's just a big battle and then they win. So, so to me, the burning of Dodaragus Hostel is like a monster manual. It, it takes the same form as a Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. So this is why it made sense to me to sort of try and insert this transhumanistic, futuristic plot into, into this location. Um, so when you entered the shed, you were given two torches. One was a regular torch and the other one was a UV torch. And so inside the shed, you could shine your regular torch and see all of all of these different monster monster drawings and these sort of details. But then when you shone your uh, UV torch, you saw all this secret information, um, which told you that there were all these po portals where you know you could enter, you dove down under the river in Glen Smol and you popped up at a Swiss chalet restaurant in Tokyo in the year 2349 and you know the, the evil people were the augments they were the bodies and sort of so it showed you there was all white string that collect that connected this was the Pelnar universe roughly one million years into the future and there's all these bees that have nerve gas on their backpacks and stuff like this and so so it was very much trying to take this mythological past but impose future on, onto it and sort of impose the internet so this part you can like actually emerge inside the internet within this sort of role playing game so this was very interesting to me because of the sort of lack of a huge irish science fiction history um, this book came out in 2014 by Jack Fennell, where he tried to talk about what is Irish science fiction, um, what's it made of. We can say that Gulliver's Travels, um, Dracula, the picture of Dorian Gray, stories by Lord Dunsany, we can talk about those as Irish science fiction or precursors or fantasy or horror, but what is it? Because it's not a very well-known genre um, internationally. So sort of he, Jack Fennell did a lot of work and he found these sort of early children's books on Captain Sperling, Sposs Pilota, who, who sort of goes into space um, and sort of, um, you know, goes to the moon and then comes back and causes peace on Earth. Like, so it's sort of very, like these are typical sort of kids sci-fi. Like there's a whole story where a Kerry man goes to the moon for a long time, which is completely bizarre for Irish people. Um, so, so this was trying to carve out this sci-fi space, um, but still, I didn't know anything about this when I was growing up. When nobody talked about this, we didn't think that there was an Irish sci-fi tradition. It was extremely, sort of when we thought about what was Irish sci-fi or what was a future vision of what Ireland could be, it was very difficult to figure that out because the predominant visual media that we got that was being made at that time was things like this. So this, you know, these are two, um, two artworks by Jim Sheridan. If, oh, sorry, not Jim Sheridan, that's the director. Jim Fitzpatrick. So if you ever go to holiday, on, if you go to, on holiday in Ireland and you go to like a tourist shop, they'll have all these lovely sort of 
Jürgen Steele in a Celtic network, net not work mode type postcards. And it's normally, it's extremely, you know, gendered. You've got the pretty haired, you know, Irish lady who's being protected by the, you know, red haired Viking looking Irish warrior. Um, this is a rendering of Critna, um, who's the daughter of uh, Lochan. And so Finn McCool, if you remember from my first anecdote, which was merely 19 minutes ago. Um, so Finn McCool at one point, you know, goes to Lochan because he wants Lochan in the great tradition of all mythological tales to get the really clever blacksmith to make him magic weapons. And then he notices Lochan's beautiful daughter, Krishna, and he marries her, but only for a little while. And so sort of, so, you know, when I'm looking and I'm trying to figure out, well, where do I fit? And I'm Irish and I like movies and comics and, you know, but where do I fit into it? It's sort of quite a limited space because you're thinking we're either looking way back at mythology and, you know, Krishna, it's this sort of we, her gossamer gown, not practical for the Irish weather, um, you know, and you can sort of clearly see her nipples and you're sort of going, I don't know, where do I fit in? The only other alternative is things like this. So um, this is, these are the only two graphic novels I could find as a kid that were set that had anything to do with Ireland. Uh, one of them was, everybody says slain, because that sounds more battley, but it's actually pronounced Slonia, which, you know, doesn't quite have the same ring. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's Slonia, the Slonia novels by Pat Mills and a variety of different, different illustrators over the course of it. You know, but it's sort of like Braveheart plus steroids, more steroidy. Um, and then there's 2000 AD uh, featuring, there was one, uh, just a couple of issues where they had a storyline where Judge Dredd went to Ireland. And as you can see, there's a very sensitive treatment of Irish stereotypes, you, you know, right from the beginning with the Irish policeman with a harp thing at drinking a pint. And, and in, in sort of 2000 AD, when they go to the Emerald Isle, like there's references to the spudatorium. There's so many potato jokes, um, you know, in it. And sort of an Ireland is sort of almost recontextualized as a giant Irish pub theme park. Um, so sort of, you're sort of thinking, okay, it's sort of fun in that it's sort of, you know, we can either say it's it's just more stereotypes or it's a savage parody of the stereotypes. Sometimes it's very hard to tell which is which. Um, but but you're sort of going, where do I fit in? Also because, you know, I'm not a dude like Slonia um, and, and I'm not quite sure what happens. Like, where's the past? Where's the future in this? Because it's still messing with these stereotypes. It's not thinking, it's not thinking like uh, what's happening in Ireland 200 years into the future. And that's something that I wanted. Because if we go back to the Irish sci-fi, the, the sort of the fantastic bibliography that Jack Fennell has created usually revolves around books which are about, um, you know, Irish people somehow overthrowing the English colonialists with the intervention of aliens. Or, um, you know, they travel to another planet and get like a chemical they need to overthrow the English. Um, these sort of early books. And I think they're really amazing because people were trying to dream these different alternative futures. Um, and, it, and it was sort of suppressed because at the time, a lot of the time in Ireland, the idea that even Irish people could do science, you know, wasn't accepted, let alone science fiction. So people didn't want to, to sort of make this sort of trashy pulp genre and have that disregarded even further. Um, but this, this comes back to me in these works like the Legend of the Four Nar Resistance, where I'm trying to think about, well, how do we dream forward into the future in Ireland? If we're completely trapped in the past, we're completely screwed because we're only just sort of rehashing, we're rehashing imagery that looks like this over and over and over again, rather than trying to project forward. Um, so I then started doing works where I was deliberately trying to take things like this, um, which is the Dolmen in Ochna Cliff, County Longford, which is about, I don't know, between 4,000 and 3,000 BC. Um, but taking the Arachibo message, which uh, Carl Sagan helped write in 1974, and sort of placing it on top of it, almost like it becomes a beacon. And so within the sort of the group at uh, context, I started making these sort of sci-fi interventions, so doing things like, um, this is the Voyager, but it's covered in Celtic knotwork. D you know what I mean? So, so, and this was positioned as a storybook which goes with this image um, that's sort of, it's almost unreadable. It's in a H, it's like, it's a H.P. Lovecraft, like times 10, um, sort of last, you know, these sort of Lovecraft stories where you, um, 
And the, the full title of it is The True and Honest Testimony of Osborne on a Ciferous Marsh by Istram Gusset. Um, and the whole idea is that it's this terrible document that's found floating on this space probe because they went to their inexorable doom in County Longford in Ireland uh, to this sort of portal to, 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 to the other world and things like that. I also started doing projects where I was trying to rewrite Irish history to a large extent. So I did a whole series of projects called With special thanks to the National Museum of Ireland. Um, and of course, the National Museum of Ireland had no part or knowledge of these projects. So I would take things like the Knock Vicar Stone Circle, um, which is very curious because it's a micro stone circle which is a very unusual size, um, and, and I, would, I would exhibit it. So this is in England, it was also exhibited in Germany, um, and these were stones that were dug out of my field, which is why you can see there's actually moss and grass growing on that stone there. Um, and what I found was that these, th this would be exhibited and people would say they had this beautiful experience while they looked at it. Or they would say, you know, I felt that like this, this one stone was the headstone or like the keystone. And this wasn't about fooling people or making them feel stupid. It was about trying to open up that space. Um, because if you bring in a stone circle from Ireland, you have a chance to do that because people associated with these ancient things and, and, and so I really liked this and I thought it was really beautiful and I really valued the fact that people said they had these experiences or they felt calm after spending time looking at the stone circles and things like that. Um, sort of more radical ones were things like this, which these are um, uh, pieces that I claimed um, were Robert Boyle's alchemical apparatus. So Robert Boyle, born in Waterford in Ireland, um, he's very important because he's considered the father of modern chemistry, this really important rational actor, you know, who pioneered the modern scientific experimental method. And there is some feeling that the, uh, there's a book called The Aspiring Adept, which said, no, he was always secretly an alchemist. And that was just a front, like modern chemistry, because he, in the marginalia, you can see all these references to alchemy. And so I did find a letter, a real letter that Newton wrote to Robert Boyle, because Boyle had written to him and said that he'd managed to complete an alchemical process. And Newton wrote back, and I have to quote this, you must keep high silence. It cannot be communicated without immense damage to the world. And this is so Da Vinci code. I, I just love it. Um, because, you know, Newton and Boyle are corresponding about how this secret information can't go out into the world. It's too dangerous. So... Um, what I did was my dad, who's a potter, uh, made all this alchemical apparatus for me. And so we spent a lot of time like researching um, alchemical apparatus structures. And then he tried to glaze them in such a way that they looked like they'd been used a lot in laboratories. And then we sort of exhibited them with this sort of tasteful faux, um, faux alchemical, you know, the sun on the tiles and the different astronomical um, uh, sort of astrological so and nobody ever questioned it. You know, everybody always thought it was completely legit. And that, isn't that interesting? Robert Boyle was secretly an alchemist and, and the National Museum of Ireland has all his al alchemical apparatus. And, and I really love this because, um, you know, we could research pelican flask structure and alembics and sort of do this with these gloppy glazes. And people would look at them and have these and sort of tell me stories or think about how they thought about these things. And that brings us on to Ashtok. So Ashtok then is sort of the culmination of all those strands together. Um, it's a project that was launched at the beginning of 2015. If you just go to ashtok.org, you come to this website, um, which claims to be the avant-garde archive of Ireland. Um, sort of like Ubu was really, really sort of inspirational to us and in how we were trying to position it. Uh, the graphic designer wanted it to be very slightly nice, but still look like an NGO that didn't really have enough money to spend on graphic design. So he very deliberately did it like this. Um, and when you go to the Ashtok archive and you click on about Ashtok, you get a statement um, that's saying that the Ashtok, you know, the Ashtok Foundation was founded by a poet and a composer. Um, and then there's a little disclaimer. And when you click on the disclaimer, it's, uh, it, it then we tell the truth that this is a thought experiment. And this is sort of an attempt to, um, um, create contact with a parallel universe where this history did actually happen. 
So right now, it did happen. We're in contact with that parallel universe right now because I'm talking about it and you're imagining it in your head. Uh, so with Ashtok, it involved a huge team of different contributors. Um, I have two more books I'll pass around. One is the Ashtok book and the other one is actually the book of the legend of the four-hour resistance. Uh, but there's a lot of different people involved in it and I got funding from the Arts Council of Ireland, which was quite amazing that they gave me a lot of money to make a, an archive of completely fake knowledge. Uh, we I was talking about this with uh, Myrna and Christina last night, and I was saying in the UK university system, there's this obsession with you know knowledge production and impact, and we call this pathways to negative impact because we created knowledge that's actually completely fake. Um, so a huge amount of people worked on it. A lot of different research gave us a lot of different paths. And I suppose the one that I think is, is really is, is great to talk about is the black magic fear in two border towns. Now, the, the graphic designer who built the website for this is named Simon O'Connor. He's a fantastic composer and graphic designer, and he runs the Little Museum of Dublin. So he gave us access to their archives, and we sort of drew freely when we needed ephemera from their archives to sort of plonk it in. And everybody thinks that this is photoshopped. Um, it's a story from 1973 in the Sunday World about how um, there's this huge fear because two border towns, they found evidence that people are worshipping Satan. And so border towns, we mean the border between North of Ireland and Republic of Ireland. Now, I love this because this is not Photoshop. This is completely real. And it's the product of a PSYOPs campaign that the British Army ran in Northern Ireland between 1972 and 1974. Um, it ran both sides of the border. They planted over 70 fake stories in the press about Satanism and black magic worship, which they were trying to link to terrorism. Um, in an effort to deter people from joining the IRA or the UVF um, because, you know, it would be satanic. So the, the logic is astounding. Um, if you think that they thought, you know, these people, they might want to blow up British soldiers, but if we suggest to them that the IRA are satanists, they might not join, you know, the IRA, because like the, 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 the explosions are one thing, but worshipping the devil, that's like a bridge too far. Uh, sort of like the, the psychology is amazing to me. Um, there's a great book by Richard Jenkins called Black Magic and Bogeyman. Um, that's all about this, this entire period. It's also nuts because The Exorcist and The Devil Rides Out were in the cinemas at the same time. So people would go to see The Exorcist and come out completely terrified. And then they'd see this, the IRA are Satanists. You know, I saw that in the film. It's really terrifying. Um, and they did things like they created fake black magic worship sites with like a dead sheep and a sort of a magic circle drawn in the sand. So when I read about this, I, I just, it blew my mind that this ever happened. Um, but, but also it provided us the perfect node where we could insert the fact that Irish people invented noise music. Um, because then I could take the Kilbride and Malone duo, Niall Kilbride on the saxophone, Kil Karen, Karen Malone on the drums, and their awful noise improvisations in Limerick. And I could say, okay, uh, they were left playing at these black magic worship sites because anybody who heard these recordings said the, saxoph the saxophonist sounded like he was possessed. Um, you know, and of course, they emigrated to New York and then John Zorn had them play and stole their ideas. So um, that sort of, the whole thing with Ashtok was that there was no way to go back and just say, okay, these things happened. We had to go back and like look at history and think, okay, it was like looking at a, a tarmac a tarmac car park and just go, there's a tiny crack there. Maybe a seed could, could just land in that crack and there'd be just enough dirt that that seed could grow into a plant. That's what it was like. Because when I went back, for example, there was no Irish data. <laughs> So that was the first thing, that was the most, like that was the sort of almost beta test of the entire project, was that the first thing that I did was think about, I love data, when I read about data it blew my mind when I was a kid, and then I was very sad that there was no Irish data. Um, and, and you know, growing up in Ireland you felt all the cool stuff happened in London or Berlin or Paris, and they felt very, very far away. And in terms of cultural capital you always felt like I'm always going to be an outsider because I didn't grow up in those cultures and, I, and I'm not attached to that scene. Um, so data was very important, but Irish data has to function in a different way because there wasn't a robust enough middle class that you could have had space for the avant-garde weirdos who were producing the data. 
which means that Irish data has to be produced by working class people instead. And that means that you have to do an awful lot of research into labour law in Ireland and you have to try and figure out were there any companies that maybe it wasn't too bad and everybody wasn't working 16 hours, they were only working 12 hours a, a day, that maybe there would have been time in the day that they could have made art or maybe the company they worked for, the, the, the institution they worked for would have supported that in some way, which leads me to the only possible choice, which is Guinness. Um, <laughs> because Guinness had the most advanced labor laws in Europe at that time, and their workers were cared for. And I know that because A, I did the research, and B, my granddad worked there, and my dad worked there. You know, so sort of, I knew about it from the inside, and I had these long discussions with my father where he talked about like, oh yeah, if you did drawings, they would display them in this shop front, you know, and, and sort of, so I could sort of start to see that Guinness was a candidate for the Guinness Dadaists to emerge. Um, so my dadaists, my dadaists all worked for Guinness. Do you know? And their names are Dermot O'Reilly, Kevin Leeson, and Brian Sheridan. And and sort of they they sort of were different. They never were accepted by the other dadaists because they could not be fully pacifists. They could not be full uh, full pacifists because they were pacifists as far as World War I was concerned, but they could not be pacifists with regard to the Irish Civil War because that did, it just wouldn't have made sense to me that they would have been pacifists with regard to the Irish Civil War. So dadaism in Ireland has to emerge later than it does everywhere else. It, it emerges in the early 20s. It has to be working class people and there has to be this split, because for them, um, it's political. So for my Guinness dadaists, um, all of their sound poetry is written with the Irish rules of pronunciation, <laughs> because that means no English people can read it. Um, so this is, uh, this is one that I perform. So that up there says, Gel Diddly Idol. <laughs> Uh, this is Sassen Sassenacht, Flosk Lech Lech Hussen Ege. So these are all things that I can read. This is the Irish, the old Irish script that we use for the Irish, the Irish alphabet. So for them, it's a very political, it's a sort of a, a sort of a very sort of political project because they're trying to make this art that takes Irishness and does something new with it. Because when they're around the Guinness Dadists, on the one hand, they have like WB Yeats and the Celtic revivalists who are sort of looking very wistfully into the past with the emerald tinted glasses. It was all so much better back then. It was just so much better when everybody looked like this. Do, do you know what I mean? In the past. And then on the other hand, and you had um, these sort of more contemporary modernist, um, modernist painters like Mani Jellet that often left Ireland. They sort of were brought up in Ireland, but they went to study on the continent. They didn't, they didn't study in Ireland. So that's sort of how I had to try and position them. But as a result of that, through all this research, you find this little weird hole and this idea sort of starts to sort of establish itself and emerge. Um, other things that sort of popped up with the with the Ashtok project, I'm going to move along a little quicker because I can see the time here. Um, and I should say, all of this material is on the website. So all of the sound files are up there. There's essays um, about all the different people involved. There's a book that you can you order direct from Lulu. So you just pay Lulu, and they post it to you wherever you are if, if you want to order it. But all the material is on the website if you're if you're interested. Um, another sort of thread that came up that we noticed again and again um, was drone. Is drone became absolutely absolutely central, apparently, to the fictional Irish avant-garde musical history. Um, because different people who were contributing would send in, you know, they'd say, oh, I've written 2,000 words about this person, and I go, here's Drone. Occult, the occult and Drone were two, two big, big touchstones that we saw again and again. Um, and that leads to this 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 sort of uh, this sort of identity, which is Porg Macjolawira, um, Patrick Murray um, in English. Uh, so the idea with Porg Macjolawira was that um, this is where drone music and minimalism is born. Um, so this was first presented as a listening post in the Chelsea Art Museum in a show. I had a solo show called Irish Need Not Apply um, back in, in 2010. And what was amazing to me was that everybody thought this was completely legit. Um, and it was my way of sort of intervening in the argument about who invented drone. And uh, I, have, I worked a lot with Tony Conrad. He was a very good friend of mine. And it sort of emerged from discussions that he and I had had when we were talking about the Dream Syndicate 
Connecticut and the fact that Lamont Young is still sitting on all of those tapes and will not release them um, until people sign a document claiming that they're Lamont Young's compositions as opposed to group improvisations. And that's something that Tony had interrogated in early minimalism and works like that. Um, and I was sort of joking with him one day and I said, you know, what if Irish people invented it like way before then? And he was like, go for it. Um, so sort of, so sort of, he and I made these recordings where we sort of sent them back and forth to one another and added like very, you know, terrible record crackle onto them, so they sounded old. And then I, I thought, I really want to do this. I want to go deeper down this path. And and I talked to some Irish etymologists, some Irish language experts, and I said, well, what would be the Irish word for drone? And they said, there's loads of words for drone in the Irish language. It's like Eskimos and snow. And so there's all these different types of drones that we can refer to. But the word they suggested, which I really loved, is Durdon. And Durdon comes from the word Deirdre, the name Deirdre, because when Deirdre was in her mother's room, she emitted these really long screams, um, these long droning screams. So, so I really liked that sort of etymology. So, I made this listening post, I, I made this collection of excerpts from recordings which had been found languishing in the Irish Folklore Commission's archives. Um, so that's their logo, and which I have no permission to use. So I claimed that the Irish Folklore Commission had made these recordings because they did, the Irish Folklore Commission did tour Ireland in the 50s, and they made all of these recordings, and a lot of them are sitting in boxes, you know, in UCD. It's amazing the work that they did. So I claimed that these, of course, were found by an intrepid musicologist who dusted them off and found evidence that drone music was invented in Ireland in 1952. Um, so, so sort of how th this was positioned was that people came in, they listened to short excerpts, and uh, the, the, the good thing about coming from an Irish perspective and positioning things as coming out of an Irish avant-garde is nobody ever thinks that you're being... Um, people don't mind it, in that there's a way that you can play with Irishness as a medium that allows for that. It would have a very different meaning if I came in and I was from a different country. Um, and so it's also understanding that people have a, like it or not, if I say to you guys, what are your stereotypes of Irish people? Um, if you don't come up with something to do with like drinking pints and being warm and friendly, um, you know, uh, I don't know what culture that you sort of came from in that I've spent my whole life with people asking me why I won't drink more and uh, and, Irish, and and telling me how friendly all Irish people are. Uh, so sort of so sort of there's stereotypes that you can play with. There's sort of I think that Irishness itself is allowed to play a sort of a trickster role as a nationality, <laughs> without it being without it seeming obnoxious or something like that. It doesn't seem imperialistic for me to claim that Cork-based musicians were doing these weird improv um, sessions in 1952, and that's how drone music um, that's how drone music happened. So I'll just play you a short clip so you can hear what it sounds. Sounds like. It goes on like that for a long time. Um, so another, I'll, I'll mention just briefly two other identities. Um, one is Sister Anselm. I think that she's the most beloved, um, the most beloved person in, in Ashtok, and I get a lot of emails about Sister Anselm. Um, so Sister Anselm is a nun. Um, she was born in Galway in 1940, and she died in Galway in 1988. Um, and she was the youngest of seven children. So because she was born into a poor family, um, the parents sort of, um, sort of very much encouraged her to go and be 
a nun. Um, sort of that sometimes happened when you had a family with seven children, they encouraged the youngest child to go off and join the church in some way. So Sister Anselm entered an enclosed community of Carmelite nuns in Lockery in Galway at the age of 16, and she remained there until she died. And over the course of her life, she was responsible for all aspects of uh, the music that, that was sort of produced within the convent. And she worked with the nuns on their singing, and she started composing these strange organ compositions that she called virtues. Um, so the only documentation that we have of Sister Anselm is this picture, because it was this enclosed order. Um, and we only have the recording I'm going to play because a radio documentary series called In the Footsteps of Hildegard uh, was, was made uh, by NPR in America, which was produced by the musicologist Judith Schaefer and the anthropologist Verena Shaw. And they went to Lockery and they were allowed to make these recordings. It was all, um, they made a lot of, uh, they were very, very interested in women in these enclosed closed orders. So um, these, these sort of compositions, these organ drone compositions are sort of her form of contemplative prayer. So they're quite long, so I'm, I'm going to actually just fast forward a little bit into this one so that you can hear it as it unfolds. I should say very much that like this really is an organ and it's a, it's recorded acoustically and there's no processing and nothing nothing has been done to the sound it's just working with the air the air sounds inside like an old organ where you literally are pulling out the stops one millimeter at a time and the air is changing its path through the organ um, I'll stop just very briefly. I'll mention Cuivin Branagh uh, because he's uh, responsible for the on Glerk, the film that you guys saw on Friday night. Um, uh, just very, very quickly. So, Cuivin Branagh is probably the, the persona in Ashtok that's closest to me. Uh, Cuivin Branagh means Kevin Walsh in English. So, whenever I exhibit his works in Ireland, people always say to me, is he a relative? And I say, yes, he's my great uncle. And um, I have a little house in Knock Vicar, and in my head, um, I inherited it. Um, and it was full of bin bags, full of tapes and artwork. Um, instead, I bought it from an English woman, and it was full of dog food. Uh, so, so, sort of, um, which it took a lot of time to get that out uh, the smell away. Uh, so sort of, so I, so Cuivin Branagh is very important to me because it's this link that I feel very strongly with Ireland, but it's the sort of link that I want to have where it's something that's, that's strange and it's sort of working with outsider culture. So he's a cassette obsessive. So he records sounds on tapes or he was until before he died in 2009. Um, he records sounds on tapes, buries them for periods of the astronomical power of the calendar, wraps them in moss, sprays them with holy water, um, does all these strange processes to them. He has all these diaries that he writes in Ogham, which is an Irish script, uh, where he talks about different frequencies he exposed the cassettes to, how he had these stomach problems, and he, he slept with the cassette bound to his belly to try and heal his stomach problems. He makes his own instruments, um, so he sort of burns um, Ogham, is, Again, this Irish alphabet, this is considered, and it's a medieval Irish alphabet, this is considered an occult scale that it was used for occult purposes. Uh, they call them scales, these different versions of the alphabets. So, so with Cuivin, the film that you saw, that was my way of trying to like um, make, his, make his sort of world vision into, in, in, into sort of reality. Um, so I, I have to stop there because Lucas told me 
I didn't have an hour I had 45 minutes. So thanks very much. You can look at the website. There's lots more material <laughs> involved in the website. <laughs>